Part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch is the oldest known apocalyptic writing in history. Although the ancient work deals with a biblical figure mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments, it was never intended to be included in the official canon of Christianity and Judaism. Enoch To find out who Enoch was and which of his experiences were worthy of being recorded for history, we should first take a look at the official version of the Bible. However, when leafing through the holy scriptures of Christianity, it quickly becomes clear that the information available is extremely sparse. In the Old Testament, Enoch is only mentioned in passing in a short passage. The relevant passage in Genesis says that Enoch is the son of Jared. He in turn descended from Set, who was the third son of Adam and Eve. That Enoch was drastically different from normal people becomes clear when we consider the age ascribed to him. Accordingly, Enoch is said to have lived for almost 365 years. However, this incredible lifespan is nothing compared to the age reached by Enoch's children. Thus, the biblical figure fathered Methuselah, among others. The so-called forefather before the flood is said to have lived to be almost a thousand years old. The New Testament then stretches the story of Enoch a little further. The epistle to the Hebrews emphasized that Enoch was loved by God and was called up because of his sincere faith. But what does that mean? In detail, this means that Enoch was allowed to ascend to the kingdom of heaven without having to die. At this point, the official description of the Bible ends. If you want to know more about the background of this exciting figure and find out which supernatural experiences Enoch allegedly went through, you have to direct your attention to some other writings, the so-called apocryphal Enoch books. Banned Scrolls between 1947 and 1956, the Dead Sea Scrolls were rediscovered. For the history of the Hebrew Bible, this find represented nothing less than a breathtaking world sensation. The ancient scrolls, hidden in various caves, deal primarily with texts with religious content. However, part of this gigantic archaeological treasure was also a vast collection that would later come to be known as the Ethiopian Book of Enoch. The special feature, it's the oldest known apocalyptic writing in history. As part of their evaluation, the experts came to the conclusion that the Book of Enoch had already been prepared in the 3rd century BC. For comparison, the famous Revelation of John from the New Testament is dated to the year 95 AD. The main reason why the comprehensive collection of the Enoch story is referred to as the Ethiopian book is that the complete work has only been preserved in the ancient Ethiopian language. This in turn has the background that the Book of Enoch is an integral part of the Ethiopian church, which is in stark contrast to the other Jewish and Christian communities in the world. Nowhere else has the work been included in the official canon. But why is that? Do the scriptures possibly contain secret information that not only shakes our religion, but also our general view of the world? Let's take a closer look. Enoch's Ascension As mentioned earlier, Enoch is said to have been brought into heaven by God during his lifetime. However, the Bible still owes us an answer to the question of how exactly this ascent into the kingdom of heaven took place. The Ethiopian Book of Enoch is much more informative in this regard. Old divine and heavenly mysteries are said to have been revealed to Enoch during his rapture. The fall of the angels is also described in detail in the ancient collection of scriptures. To understand this, let's take a closer look at the writing entitled The Book of the Watchers. According to tradition, the angel Semyaza decides to invade the earth along with some other of these supernatural beings. The goal of the angels is to subdue human women and have offspring spring with them. From this mixture of earthly and heavenly beings, wild giants emerge. The giants then throw the world into chaos and arouse the deep wrath of God. So it is that the Lord in heaven banishes the angels from paradise. But that's not all. 
the fallen servants of God are to be thrown into a lake of blazing flames on their final day. In order to wipe out the giants from the earth, God wants to conjure up a gigantic flood. Faced with their fate, the fallen angels beg for mercy, a desperate plea that God refuses. This is where Enoch comes in. He's commissioned to deliver God's drastic decision to the fallen angels. After he's delivered the message, he's finally visited by two angels and taken to heaven. During his subsequent ascent, Enoch again gets a detailed insight into the divine realm. A Glimpse into the Sky Where the expression divine realm comes from is somewhat misleading. In fact, there are rumored to be seven different levels of heaven with conceivably different residents, according to some denominational religious beliefs. This idea is also shared in the Book of Enoch, which is largely why some religions do not include this book in the Canon Bible, because no other book of the original Hebrew Bible shares this idea of there being seven levels of heaven. In every other book of the Old and New Testament, only heaven is mentioned. There is not once a mention of another realm of heaven aside from the one and only heaven, which Enoch is said to have ascended to. According to this idea, in the first level heaven are the clouds and the stars. In the level above the fallen, damned angels await their fate. The third heaven in turn houses what we would commonly call the biblical paradise. This is where the souls of godly people are brought. However, in the north of the third heaven is also hell, where sinners receive their punishments. Passing the sun and the moon, and gigantic guardians and choirs of angels, we finally reach the seventh and highest heaven. Here is the throne of God, and only a few archangels are permitted to dwell at the side of the Lord of the Worlds. According to the Book of Enoch, after arriving at the side of the Creator, Enoch is commissioned to write down everything that the Creator dictates to him. In addition to the mysteries of heaven and earth, this also includes the story of creation. In just 30 days, Enoch completed 360 books. Armed with these new writings, Enoch is sent back to earth. The books are then given to Enoch's sons. He instructs his children to renounce all sins and at the same time warns them of the approaching flood with which God will wipe out the wild giants. This information helps Enoch's great-grandson, Noah, prepare in time for the devastating flood and build his Ark of Salvation. After Enoch has carried out the tasks assigned to him, he's finally admitted to the heavenly paradise. With all this in mind, it begins to become clear why the Book of Enoch was removed from the Bible. We know that many years ago, the Bible was carefully curated by experts who decided which books were canon and which were not. This was done in an attempt to free the Bible from any attempts at fraud. After all, as writing was becoming more commonplace and more and more people were seeking to disband the Christian faith once and for all, the church needed to do something to ward off anyone who wanted to lead Christians astray. Thus, sometime around 382 AD, the Bible was combed through and the canon books of the Bible were decided upon. Books such as Enoch were removed because they didn't align with all the other books that were determined to be canon. In fact, some books didn't align with one another at all, including one non-canon book titled The Wisdom of Solomon. This has led some people to believe that the Bible as a whole cannot be trusted. This is largely because of the idea that if non-canon books can be removed, who's to say that canon books may not have been removed as well? If the Bible was curated by humans, what kept human influence from removing important books of the Bible? In actuality, it's clear to see that all the remaining books of the Bible perfectly align with one another and don't contradict with a handful of exceptions that have been determined to have been the result of minor mistranslations. Aside from this, every book of the modern Bible shares the same story without incident. On the contrary, the books that were removed, now known as the apocryphal books, contradict one another at every angle and don't align with the other 66 books that are found to have been authentic. Thus, a total of 15 non-canon books were removed. So, what does this mean for the Book of Enoch? 
To put it simply, the book appears to have been created fraudulently. Its story doesn't align with the other 66 books, and no ancient translations of the book have been found, suggesting that it may have been written in much more modern times. Aramaic fragments of the book have been found, suggesting that ancient Jews and some Christians were aware of the book, but we have no evidence that the book was ever studied or verified by first-century Christians, as is true with most other books of the Bible. Enoch and Pre-Astronautics There are many different reasons why some people believe that the Book of Enoch was banned from the Bible. When you look at it from a strictly historical context as mentioned, it's obvious that the Book of Enoch doesn't belong because the book doesn't echo the beliefs that are shared all throughout the Bible. Because of this, the book has been sworn off by both denominational and non-denominational churches. However, there's a much more bizarre theory that has been passed around in recent years. As it would turn out, some people believe that the book was removed from the Bible as part of a worldwide conspiracy. This conspiracy would have been shared and agreed upon by every church across the globe, and thus the Book of Enoch was removed. According to this idea, the Book of Enoch doesn't actually share religious history, but instead shares the story of a mysterious alien abduction. Yes, according to this theory, the secret writings of Enoch confirm the theories about ancient alien visitors. Remember, the parascience of pre-astronautics is based on the belief that the ancients were regularly visited by extraterrestrial intelligences. But how do God, fallen angels, and bloodthirsty giants reconcile the views of this theory? Well, this is because the pre-astronauts have a slightly different interpretation of the events recorded in the Book of Enoch. In this theory, the creatures that descended on Earth and mingled with women were not biblical servants of God, but aliens. The figure referred to as God in the Book of Enoch was in fact not the heavenly creator, but the head of the extraterrestrial species. The rapture of Enoch to paradise thus had less in common with an ascension to heaven than with a classic alien abduction. So, what Enoch saw during his journey was either the spaceship of the extraterrestrial beings or their home planet. The flood that was conjured up by God could therefore have been the result of a highly developed extraterrestrial weapon. At first glance, it seems very difficult to place the events described in the Book of Enoch in such a cosmic context. In fact, this collection of writings also contains a passage that touches on this area at least to a certain extent. Although the so-called astronomical book doesn't speak of aliens and spaceships, it still gives us an impression of how our planet and its galactic neighborhood are structured. As a result, the Earth is not an almost spherical celestial body, but a flat disk. In addition, our earthly homeland doesn't revolve around the Sun. Instead, it's the Sun that orbits the Earth. Anyone who actually believes in the pre-astronautical background of the Enoch story will sooner or later come across a central question. Why have aliens not visited us since ancient times? After all, they've made themselves known to mankind openly in the past so that they were worshipped as heavenly beings by the inhabitants of the Earth. Some supporters of this parascience believe that another visit from the extraterrestrial intelligences is imminent because they're watching us all the time. Given the current evolution of our species, the aliens may believe that we humans are in danger of wiping ourselves out. Accordingly, with the development of atomic bombs and the like, we've now reached an explosive technical age. So according to pre-astronauts, it won't be long before the currently invisible observers will put us back on the right path. Babylon is still considered a symbol of a thriving metropolis that's ultimately doomed to collapse. But what really led to the fall of that fabled city mentioned in so many ancient scriptures and religious texts? What is Babylon? Babylon's a city that's been held in high regard for many centuries. Over the years, many theories have been shared regarding what ultimately led to the city's destruction. Ultimately, much of the history of Babylon remains a mystery, but biblical texts and other historical documents have helped to paint a somewhat clear image of what this once thriving city was all about. Babylon was the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. 
As far as we can tell, the first time Babylon popped up in written history was on a clay tablet that came from the time of Sargon of Akkad, written sometime between 2334 and 2279 BC. Today, Babylon would have existed along the Euphrates River, about 50 miles south of present-day Baghdad. The last time people lived in the city under its original name was when a small village was set up in the area sometime around the 10th century AD. Eventually, these residents were run out and the town ultimately vanished. It's been estimated that during its peak, Babylon would have been the most popular and most populated city in the world. It's believed that it would have been the first city to ever have reached a population of more than 200,000 people, which was a very, very large number of people for this time in history. It's also believed to have originally been built on around 2,200 acres of land. Many of the remains of the city still stand today, though they're merely a shadow of what once stood in this location. As time has marched on, countless raids took place that threatened Babylon and saw many of its most incredible buildings crumble. These days, only a few walls and a handful of structures remain, but they do help us to get a clear view of what this once amazing city would have been like all those years ago. Even in 2022, these locations are still open to tourists around the world, and we can still take a glimpse back into history to what was one of the very first human civilizations in the world, and certainly one of the greatest of all time. The Birth of a Cosmopolitan City after seeing Babylon with his own eyes, the Greek historian Herodotus was overwhelmed by the size and radiant beauty of the metropolis. So Herodotus later noted that Babylon was magnificent and mighty and different from any other city in the world. However, it was a long time before the dimensions of Babylon could amaze the ancient historian in such a way. In fact, the cornerstone of the later cosmopolitan city was laid in the 3rd millennium BC. At that time, the tranquil town about 90 kilometers south of today's Baghdad was just an insignificant small town. Babylon finally experienced its first heyday under the reign of King Hammurabi I. He was the sixth ruler of the first Babylonian dynasty and directed the fortunes of the empire between 1792 and 1750 BC. The long reign of the king was characterized above all by a large expansion policy. Hammurabi I not only succeeded in conquering numerous areas, but also in overthrowing the Assyrian king Ishmael Dagon I and obliging his son to pay high tributes. Through all of these successes, Babylon eventually grew into a major power in Mesopotamia. King Hammurabi I reorganized the city's administration, improved agriculture, and initiated monumental building projects, such as the erection of impressive temples dedicated to the gods. While Hammurabi's reign was undoubtedly characterized by ambitious plans for conquest, according to his records, his main goal was to improve the lives of his subjects in every imaginable area. When the day finally came when the king died, Babylon formed the beating heart of a mighty empire that ruled virtually all of Mesopotamia. However, the successors of Hammurabi I would not be allowed to uphold the political legacy of their predecessors. So it was that Babylonia's first heyday was relatively short-lived. Eventually, the first Babylonian empire fell into the hands of various foreign rulers, including the Hittites, the Kassites, and the Assyrians. The death of the Assyrian ruler Ashurbanipal was followed by a period of bloody chaos. A bitter civil war broke out within the borders of the empire, which permanently weakened the city-state. But some of the subjects, such as the Chaldean chief Nabopolassar, also recognized a political opportunity in the turmoil of the fighting, the possibility of seizing power themselves. So, Nabopolassar allied himself with some other ethnic groups. This alliance eventually managed to conquer the Neo-Assyrian Empire. After this unexpected trick, a dream came true for Nabopolassar. He ascended the throne of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. 
When the first king of the newly founded Babylon in 605 BC died, he left his son the fortified capital of Babylon and immense wealth. For the heir to the throne, Nebuchadnezzar II, it was now a matter of continuing his father's legacy and finally leading Babylonia to the top of ancient society, which he was to succeed in doing. The Tower of Babel During the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, the Neo-Babylonian Empire controlled Assyria and much of Asia Minor, Northern Arabia, Israel, and Phoenicia. The plans that Nebuchadnezzar II put into action during his reign deeply enshrined the king in historical memory. Among other things, the ruler had the Jews expelled from Babylon, conquered the city of Jerusalem, and had two important buildings built within the borders of the flourishing capital, the so-called Ishtar Gate and the legendary Hanging Gardens of Babylon. However, whether it really was Nebuchadnezzar II who had this ancient wonder of the world built has always been hotly debated among experts. The assumption that Nebuchadnezzar also ordered the legendary Tower of Babel to be built is no less controversial. This is one of the most famous biblical stories in the Old Testament. From a theological point of view, this oversized construction project is interpreted as an attempt by mankind to equate himself with God. According to biblical texts, the rumor claims that the Babylonians built the infamous Tower of Babylon so that they could reach heaven for themselves rather than needing to follow God's rule. For all the obvious reasons, God didn't take kindly to this new idea and, in a sense, cursed the tower. Up until this point, God had been giving rules to the people of Babylon and had been helping them along the way during the construction of the city. However, they didn't like the rules and guidelines that had been passed down, thus they decided to take matters into their own hands. However, since the Lord in heaven didn't like this arrogance and overconfidence of the people, he brought the tower construction to a standstill. And not by creating a great natural disaster, but by creating insurmountable confusion in the ranks of the population. This happened when God confused the language of the people so that the citizens could no longer communicate with each other and finally scattered them over the most diverse regions of the world, according to the Old Testament story. Some experts relate this biblical representation to the so-called Etemenanki. This was a ziggurat, or stepped temple tower, the remains of which were recovered in the early 20th century. To put it simply, God made it so that every construction worker who was building the tower suddenly and unexpectedly spoke a different language. As a result, none of the workers could understand what the other workers were saying. This meant that communication came to a screeching halt as the people could no longer continue with their work. As soon as this took place, the workers took their families, who presumably spoke the same language as their working men, and moved to different parts of the world where they spread their languages with the natives. According to biblical texts, this is how the various languages of the world came to be. Over time, these languages continued to evolve and branch off into the many different languages that are spoken across the globe. As we obviously have come to know, many additional languages would pop up in the following years. But this was the beginning of how the world came to speak the countless languages that are shared around the world these days. The Last King the rulers who came to power after Nebuchadnezzar II didn't display the skill of their successful predecessor. In the first decade after the king's death, the Neo-Babylonian Empire had four different rulers. The last king to rule the empire until its fall was Nabonidus. The ruler of Assyrian descent saw himself as the heir of Assyria, better known as the empire that once lost its political autonomy due to defeat by the Babylonians. Because of Nabonidus striving to restore ancient architectural and cultural traditions during his 17-year reign, he's known in retrospect as the archaeologist king. However, the king's projects met with little approval from the population. 
Accordingly, Nabonidus was extremely unpopular, especially among the priests of Marduk. The background to this was that the rulers suppressed the followers of the Babylonian god Marduk and instead placed the moon god Sin at the center of religious worship. Added to this was the fact that the reign of Nabonidus was repeatedly characterized by lengthy periods of absence. Why the king often left his capital for months is still the subject of heated debates. The attempts to explain this range from research trips to illnesses to full-blown bouts of madness. To put it more plainly, the people weren't satisfied with their new ruler, and thus the city fell into utter chaos as they had no one to guide them. When the ruler was in his office and actually taking control of the city, they didn't feel that they could trust him as he was bound to disappear for a long period of time once again at any given moment. The Fall of Babylon In the shadow of the resentment growing in the ranks of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the Persians in the East, under the leadership of Cyrus II, gained increasing power. This is how the Persians succeeded in 549 BC to bring the Lydians to their knees, a military defeat that also had devastating consequences for Babylonia. From then on, Babylon was surrounded by the Persian Empire. Babylonia was soon defeated and fell into the hands of the victorious Persians. The fall of Babylon's capital was synonymous with the end of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. From today's perspective, however, it's very difficult to reconstruct how the city was conquered in detail. This is not least due to the fact that the ancient writers described different accounts of the fall of Babylon. The Greek historians Herodotus and Xenophon reported that Babylon fell victim to a siege. Other historians have maintained that the Babylonians surrendered their capital to the superior Persians without a fight. So, while the exact nature of Babylon's defeat is still unclear, what is certain is that the Persian victory was followed by a period of profound upheaval. Thus, the conquered Babylonia was incorporated as an important province in the Persian Empire. The Aramaic language was declared the official language, although the scholars living there preferred to continue writing their papers in Akkadian. The Jews, who had once been expelled from Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar II, were finally allowed to return to their homeland. Speaking of Nebuchadnezzar II, although he's generally regarded as the most successful king of Babylonia, according to an Old Testament account, he's said to have already known about the fall of the empire during his reign. A statue made of gold, silver, and bronze appeared to the ruler in a dream. The figure was then crushed by a huge rock, which then turned into a gigantic mountain range that covered the entire globe. The prophet Daniel interpreted this cryptic dream to mean that the statue represented four successive kingdoms, including the Babylonian Empire, all of which would be destroyed by God. But even apart from religious interpretations, the further history of the defeated Babylon seems extremely interesting. The Persian province quickly developed into an important scientific location where the most diverse researchers from all over the world met to expand their general knowledge. In the 5th century BC, the astronomers living there calculated the solar year for the first time and a few decades later created the first horoscope in history. In the year 333 BC, finally, Alexander the Great invaded Babylonia. The victorious Greeks accepted the culture of the residents and added some of their own traditions and achievements to it. After the death of Alexander the Great, his divided army leaders fought each other. The entire area fell victim to raids and devastation. After the Seleucids were driven out of the area, the Parthians took over in the late 2nd century BC, thus leading to the ultimate conclusion of this once great city. According to the New Testament, one day there will appear a devilish person who takes it upon himself to challenge the teachings of Jesus Christ and deceive the believers, the Antichrist. Although this very figure will play an important role in the biblical end times, the Holy Scriptures use the term Antichrist very sparingly. For in fact, this name is only used in the epistles of John. The Antichrist 
As we mentioned at the beginning, the name Antichrist in the Bible only occurs in the letters of John. However, some terms can be found in the four Gospels that correspond to the meaning of this term. In detail, we come across expressions like false teachers, false apostles, and false prophets. And Jesus also predicted at the time that one day people would appear who would claim to have been sent down to earth to bring divine messages to mankind. The Gospel of Mark says, if someone then says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For many a false Messiah and many a false prophet will arise, and they'll perform signs and wonders, if possible, to mislead the elect. As a rule, these false prophets are regarded as human opponents of Jesus, who were sent by the devil to destroy and to fool humanity. In the first letter of John, it's written that the appearance of many antichrists will usher in the last hour. These false prophets will identify themselves by denying Jesus' identity as the Son of God. Well, we usually understand a single devilish figure when we refer to the ominous Antichrist. In early Christianity, it sometimes describes a whole group of false teachers. Unfortunately, we don't really have too clear of an idea regarding what this may mean. It could suggest that cult leaders and cultists could be considered an antichrist in future years, or it could simply mean that virtually everyone on earth will begin to deny Christ and claim that he never existed, or rather that he simply wasn't the true son of God. Whatever the case may be, it's guaranteed to be a dark day for humanity. Though we find a somewhat different representation in the last section of the New Testament in the legendary Revelation of John. The Apocalypse As the only prophetic one in the New Testament book, the Revelation of John gives us a detailed insight into the end of the world. When the Lamb, meaning Jesus Christ, opens the mystical seven seals of the book, the earth will be thrown into utter chaos. After the four horsemen of the apocalypse proclaimed the coming calamity, seven angels will blow seven trumpets. As a result, elemental catastrophes will take place that will cost countless lives, including a rain of fire and blood, the falling of a gigantic burning mountain, and the poisoning of the adversaries of Jesus Christ. In addition to animal figures, there's also a large dragon which, according to Babylonian mythology, embodies Satan. So, while we find here once again an opponent of God who incites people to disobedience to the creator of the world, the second beast also has great parallels to the classic Antichrist. This beast calls itself a prophet and calls Christians to turn away from God and instead worship the first beast form. However, the name of this idol, which people are to worship from now on, is 666. That sequence of numbers still has great significance in the occult world and is typically associated with Satanism. Because of its insidious qualities, the second beast figure of the Book of Revelation is often equated with the Antichrist mentioned in the letters of John. Ultimately, the warriors of God will succeed in defeating the devil, the Antichrist, and the first beast, and throwing them into a lake of burning brimstone. Then the last judgment will be held, at which point each person will be judged according to their deeds and assigned to either hell or paradise. Then God will create a new heaven and a new earth and dwell alongside his people on the trail of the Antichrist. Over the course of the centuries, the figure of the Antichrist was to move more and more to the center of Christian interest. Scholars always tried to interpret the form of the devilish adversary and to make statements about his arrival. So it didn't take long before the mystical Antichrist was supposed to find his way into reality. According to this, some Roman emperors such as Titus, Nero, and Decius were equated with the false prophet of the Bible. In the 7th century, the Islamic conquerors were also credited with acting on behalf of the demonic Antichrist. 
The people of the Middle Ages also located the false teacher in their own presence. In fact, the Antichrist idea was so strong at the time that some well-known scholars were commissioned to draw as accurate an overall picture of the false prophet as possible. So, the theologian Adza was given the task by Queen Gerberga to create a detailed portrait of the false teacher. Adso came to the realization that the Antichrist was descended from the devil himself and was raised by magicians and demons. He would later call himself the Son of God and seize world domination with terror. Countless Christians will be deceived by his false teachings. Those who do not will be summarily killed. When mankind is about to finally fall into the arms of the false prophet, Jesus or the Archangel Michael will appear and destroy the Antichrist. In the High Middle Ages, the supposed existence of the servant of Satan was omnipresent. At that time, if you like, it was a tried and tested political tool to identify one's enemy as Antichrist. Those who were in league with Pope Gregory VII saw Pope Clemens III as the messenger of the devil. As already mentioned, the term Antichrist is not always related to just one person, but sometimes to a large group of people. This is also the case with the Bavarian church reformer Gerhard von Reichersberg. He recognized the work of the Antichrist in the clergy's greed and thirst for fame. The list of people once suspected of being Lucifer's henchmen is long, including Pope Gregory IX, Alexander VI, and Emperor Charles IV, who also appears in this inglorious squad. What's interesting about this idea of a false prophet or an antichrist is that we don't know for sure that it's supposed to represent one person. By all means, the biblical texts actually seem to suggest that the Antichrist is much more of an idea than an entity. In this regard, the Antichrist could simply be a name that's given to those who renounce Christ and don't believe that he's the Son of God. After all, when you look at the name Antichrist, it's pretty simple to see what the name suggests. The word anti simply means opposed to or against, and Christ obviously represents the Son of God. With this simpler explanation in mind, almost anyone around us could be considered an antichrist if they're not a believer of Jesus and his teachings. Take, for example, a segment from the fourth chapter of 1 John. It reads, Beloved, do not trust every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they belong to God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ comes in the flesh belongs to God, and every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus does not belong to God. This passage suggests that there are many false prophets, and we know the false prophet is synonymous with Antichrist. The passage also suggests that the Antichrist is more of a spirit than a physical being, and that the spirit may take on many shapes, dwell in many people, and doesn't belong to God in any way, suggesting it was sent by the devil himself. With this in mind, you've probably already encountered the Antichrist spirit at some point in your life. You simply didn't realize it. This passage concludes with a very chilling statement, reading, This is the spirit of the Antichrist that, as you heard, is to come, but in fact, is already in the world. This passage provides us with confirmation that the Antichrist is already among us. The Antichrist in National Socialism No matter how far we turn the wheel of time, the figure of Antichrist remains relevant. In the 1520s, Martin Luther came to believe that the entire papacy was the Antichrist. The author of the Reformation lasted until his death in 1546. It would go beyond the scope of our video to list all the historical personalities and groups who were once suspected of being false prophets. Therefore, we're going to jump back in time and go to the beginning of the 20th century. Anyone who paid attention in history class knows that the cruel First World War raged between 1914 and 1918. 
Although the industrial warfare and the targeted mass killing embodied a frightening image of technical progress, a millennia-old motif remained. The different parties insisted on denigrating their opponents as descendants of the devil. After the end of the war, the figure of the Antichrist was also taken up in anti-Semitic propaganda. As is well known, the Nazi regime saw the absolute evil in the Jewish people, which had to be destroyed at all costs. The crude claims were that the Jews were trying to subjugate the rest of the world through deceit and conspiracies. The annihilation of the alleged Allegedly devilish Judaism was therefore equated with the redemption of the Aryan race. This terrible worldview was conveyed to the general public in a variety of ways. Even Adolf Hitler, one of the cruelest dictators in world history, saw a God-ordained background in his actions. In 1926, Hitler wrote that he would fight for the work of the Lord until Judaism was thrown back to the devil. Joseph Goebbels also shared these inhuman ideas. In his diary, he noted, The Jew is probably the antichrist of world history. Understandably, the other side represented a completely different picture. While many Nazis saw themselves as rightful saviors and warriors of God, the Nazi regime was often identified identified by its opponents as representing the Antichrist. Hitler in particular was suspected of embodying the devil's spawn. In 1941, the preacher Arnold Koster gave a talk describing the seven qualities of the Antichrist. The features presented matched very well with Adolf Hitler. The White Rose Resistance Group also took up this symbolism and called Hitler the messenger of the Antichrist in a leaflet. Current Views Following the conjectures being made about the Antichrist in the United States, it seems that the devilish servant is moving with the times. In fact, the fear of the false prophet is much more pronounced in the United States than in other parts of the world. This is mainly due to the fact that the relevant preachers are widespread in the American media and appeal to a large audience. In detail, some clergy suspect that the arrival of the Antichrist is imminent, while others, as mentioned, believe that the spirit of the Antichrist is already among us. There are indications of this in general political and social developments. The end of national borders is the first step on the way to an all-encompassing world government. But the surveillance of public space, cashless payment transactions, and electronic data processing are also seen as harbingers of the Antichrist. In the future, the mechanization of the world would result in everyone being fitted with a microchip that's even capable of mind control. Such modern Antichrist theses often go hand in hand with those conspiracy theories dealing with the ominous New World Order. While microchips that can control our brains may still seem like a work of science fiction, they are in fact being developed as we speak. While they may or may not be being developed for nefarious means of mind control, it seems to go without saying that at some point, someone will do their best to get their hands on this technology for their own dark desires. These brain implantation chips are currently being developed to help combat health issues that affect the brain. However, if they can control parts of the brain that may cause unwanted effects, who's to say that they can't control the part of your brain that controls free thought? Truthfully, anything is possible in this strange new world we find ourselves in. Whether we're interested in art or not, we've all seen Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. According to the Bible, the further course Jesus Christ took is well known. But what became of the Twelve Apostles? Who were they? And what unimaginably cruel deaths did they die? The Twelve Apostles Before we go into detail about the individual apostles and their destinies, we should first answer a fundamental question. What is an apostle anyway? According to Christian tradition, these are the close companions of Jesus who were commissioned by the Savior to preach the faith. However, the distribution of the term apostle within the Bible is very uneven. While the term is used a total of 58 times in the letters of Paul, in the Gospel of Luke and in the Acts of the Apostles, it only occurs once in the Gospel of Mark. In addition, 
The mention of the individual apostles does not paint a uniform picture. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, Judas the son of James is mentioned instead of Judas Thaddeus. Nathaniel, mentioned in the Gospel of John, is also absent from the other Gospels. Basically, the list of 12 apostles includes the following people. Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, James the elder, Jesus' favorite disciple, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Judas Thaddeus, Simon Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. From a historical point of view, however, there is still debate as to whether Jesus really appointed a circle of 12 messengers of faith. In addition, we should not make the mistake at this point and equate the concept of apostle with that of the disciples. In the New Testament, this generally means those people who followed Jesus during his lifetime. While the number is estimated in the thousands, this following, unlike the apostles, also included women such as Mary Magdalene, Martha of Bethany, and the sisters of Lazarus. After the resurrection, Jesus is said to have commissioned his disciples to prophesize other people. James the Greater and Peter So much in advance, the information that the Gospels give us about the further career of the Apostles is extremely sparse. In this regard, we only find it in the 12th chapter of Acts of the Apostles, more precisely in verses 1 to 4. It says, About this time, King Herod laid hands on some of the congregation to mistreat them, but he killed James, John's brother, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he went on and took Peter captive too. We also learn that after his captivity, Peter was delivered by an angel to the Lord. However, to understand the ultimate fate of the apostles, we need to look at the so-called Acts of Peter. This is an apocryphal Acts of the second century, which is not a part of the official Bible canon. Sentenced to be crucified by the Romans, Peter is said to have insisted on not being put to death in the same way as his Lord and Redeemer. So he said to his tormentors, I implore you, you executioners, crucify me with my head down and in no other way. Matthew How Matthew ultimately died is uncertain to this day, while Hippolytus' letter states that the disciple fell asleep peacefully in the town of Parthia. Later records also attest to an agonizing martyrdom in Ethiopia, Mesopotamia, or Persia. However, there is also disagreement about the exact cause of death in this case. In this regard, there is talk of burning and decapitation. Allegedly, the bones of Matthew, who worked as a tax collector before his religious work, came to Salerno via Pestum in the 11th century. Although the Apostle Matthew was equated with the author of the Gospel of Matthew from the second century onwards, this assignment is considered extremely unlikely today. Andreas, and he commanded that he should be scourged by seven men, and afterwards crucified, and commanded the executioners that his legs should not be pierced, and he should thus be hanged, for in this way he wished to torment him still more. The passage which we read in the extra-canonical Acts of Matthew concerning the death of the eponymous apostle shows that this messenger of the faith also died a cruel martyr's death. Just like his brother Peter, Andrew, is said to have refused to die in the same way as Jesus Christ. As a result, he was beaten to a special X-shaped cross. So it came about that this construction with two diagonally running beams not only became known as St. Andrew's Cross, but was also considered a religious sign of identification in the early Christian period. James, son of Alphaeus Basically, James the son of Alphaeus is one of the apostles about whom we know the least. Accordingly, his name is mentioned only in the New Testament lists of the apostles. His tomb is said to be in a reliquary under the high altar of the Basilica of Santi Apostoli in Rome. However, a 2021 investigation showed that the bones are from a European and therefore most likely not from James. There are different versions of his death. Why Hippolytus' letter states that the apostle was stoned and buried in Jerusalem, the Mitorologium Hieronymium reports that he died on a cross in Persia. According to other traditions, James was killed with a club, which is why he was often depicted with one from the 12th century onwards. Johannes 
As the youngest of all the apostles, John is said to have been the disciple that Jesus loved most. What's more, according to tradition, this was also the only evangelist who did not die a violent death, but a natural death, and this despite the fact that many depictions show us John sitting in a cauldron being doused with boiling oil. The early Christian writer Tertullian wrote that the apostle survived the torture unscathed and was then banished to the island of Patmos. Because of this, some historians believe that John died at a very old age as a bishop during the reign of Emperor Trajan, who ruled between the years of AD 98 and 117. Philip. The information about Philip's death could not be more different. A letter from Polycrates states that he passed away peacefully in Hierapolis. In the mythical acts of Philip from the 4th century, however, it is reported that he was taken prisoner together with his sister Mariamne and Bartholomew and brutally tortured. Before Philip was hanged upside down, his ankles and thighs were pierced. But even though Bartholomew, who was hanged naked by his hair, the two apostles would have smiled at each other relaxedly as if they felt no pain. Bartholomew In contrast to the story just mentioned, the apocryphal scripture Martyrdom of Bartholomew says, Then the king tore the purple in which he was clothed and ordered the holy apostle Bartholomew to be beaten with rods and then beheaded. In Hippolytus' letter, we learn again that the messenger of the faith was nailed upside down to the cross in an Armenian city of Alunum and was buried there. Other sources mention that Bartholomew was skinned, killed, or thrown into the sea in a sack. Simon Zealots Just like James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zealots is only mentioned in the list of the apostles. Regarding his death, Hippolytus' letter states that he died at the legendary old age of 120 years. Other sources paint a slightly different picture. According to them, the 120-year-old Simon Zealots did not die peacefully, but was crucified. Other traditions locate his death in Caucasus, in Persia, or in England. There is also a reason why we see the apostle with a saw in the iconographic illustrations. His body is said to have been violently cut in two. Judas Thaddeus In the case of Thaddeus, too, there are different death traditions. Some sources say that he died peacefully in Syria after a long life during which he converted many to the Christian faith. Other records testify that Thaddeus died a martyr's death, sometimes by the sword, sometimes by stoning, and sometimes by a cane. Thomas in the apocryphal Acts of Thomas, we read about the death of Thomas, and when he prayed, he said to the soldiers, Come and do the commands of him that sent you. And the four came and pierced him with their spears, and he fell down and died. This version appears with that presented in the epistle of Hippolytus. This is where Thomas was killed, in India, with a pine spear. Judas Iscariot in the New Testament, Judas Iscariot is the apostle who betrayed Jesus to the Romans and paved the way for the Savior's crucifixion. The Gospel of Matthew is the only one that depicts Judas as a repentant sinner after Jesus had been condemned. Accordingly, he returned the 30 pieces of silver he had received for his betrayal and then hanged himself. The situation is somewhat more drastic in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Judas bought a large field with his wages, but suffered an accident in which his body broke in two and his entrails spilled out. The mortal remains of Judas Iscariot are still said to be in that field of blood today. Turin Shroud this is one of the most highly debated discoveries from Israel, but a lot of people believe that this item, known as the Turin Shroud, could be the cloth that Jesus of Nazareth was wrapped in after he was crucified. This shroud is one of the most well-known historical items that is associated with the Bible, and it was first discovered sometime around the 14th century. The cloth shows both the front and back of a man who looks an awful lot like Jesus of Nazareth. At the time, it was common for someone to be wrapped in a large cloth 
after they had passed away. Yet no one knows what happened to the cloth Jesus was wrapped in after he arose from the dead. Most of these cloths would have remained on the bodies of those who passed away, eventually decaying alongside the body. However, the fact that this cloth even exists in the first place may serve as evidence that the story of Jesus of Nazareth and his rising from the dead may be true. However, the cloth has been called into question by many researchers and scientists who have analyzed it over the years. The cloth was investigated in the 1970s with many researchers claiming it was a fake. However, upon closer inspection, the cloth used a sewing technique that perfectly aligned with the techniques that would have been used by the Israelites many years ago. However, contrary to this, in the 1980s the cloth was examined using radiocarbon dating. We know that carbon dating is not incredibly accurate, but often, if the system doesn't work, it will lead researchers to believe an item is much older than it really is. However, in this case, the results said the exact opposite, claiming that the cloth-like came from between the 13th and 14th centuries. Further analysis also claims that fragments of pigments were found on the cloth, confirming that the apparent blood stains were not blood at all, but rather artificial pigments. This shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, like a thin piece of cloth like this being discovered hundreds of years after Jesus' crucifixion would be highly unlikely. By all means, it seems a little bit too good to be true, and that seems to be the case. But either way, this was a very interesting discovery. Dead Sea Scrolls Between 1947 and 1956, a series of scroll fragments were found in a cave system in the West Bank area. There were a total of 850 scrolls that were collected, now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of the contents of the scrolls date back to biblical times, and much of the information in the scrolls refer to biblical history and biblical stories. Most of the scriptures found were written in Hebrew, but some were also written in Greek and Aramaic. They were dated between 250 BC and 70 AD, with some of these scrolls even referencing to religions other than Christianity. What is very interesting about the scrolls is that they tell the same story as can be found in most modern Bibles. The history, characters, and lessons are all identical, though some of these scrolls include a few additional texts or changes in wording. This is important because it shows how writers would have been able to add their own spin onto ancient biblical stories, calling a lot of translations into question, especially the King James translation which is so popular today. The most important part of these scrolls is that it confirms many of the biblical stories that have been shared for hundreds of years. It also shows that some of these writers may have had agendas when they translated the ancient texts and how we must be careful who we get our information from. The story of Noah's flood is one of the best known and most fascinating stories in the Bible. While most scholars have interpreted the description of the Great Cataclysm as a purely symbolic account, there are a growing number of researchers who claim that the biblical deluge actually happened. As a result, more and more evidence is now coming to light, showing that thousands of years ago, the earth was indeed struck by an unimaginable flood. The Flood Before we look more closely at the breathtaking background of the Flood, we should first get a brief overview of the catastrophe described in the Bible. Genesis chapter 7 says, And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, thou and all thy house, because I have found you righteous. Take with you seven of every clean animal, the male and his female, and a pair of each of the unclean animals, likewise of the birds of the air, seven each, to keep offspring alive on all the earth. For seven days from now I will bring rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and will wipe out from the face of the earth every living thing that I have made. And Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him to do, but he was six hundred years old when the flood came on earth. We also learn that Noah went on board the ark with his family, that is, his wife, his three sons and their wives, and the animals. Puzzlingly enough, in the context of the flood, the mysterious seven wise men are mentioned again and again, who survived the flood and then laid the foundation for the new age of human civilization. But who were these figures really? And what did they have to do with the construction of the first ancient temples and the Egyptian pyramids? Mystical Temple 
So, our search for clues begins in ancient Egypt, more precisely on the walls of the Temple of Edfu. Located between Luxor and Aswan, the structure was probably built between the years 237 and 157 BC. The sparsely preserved wall fragments are interpreted by the scientists as the texts that are supposed to explain the beginning of the cosmos. What's more, within these ancient symbols are said to be some hidden messages that let the historical truth shine in a completely new light. Representing that mystical temple that existed from the beginning of the world, this building is said to have served as a reminder and projection of divine origin. The Seven Wise Men but what could have been meant by the beginning of the world? Did this designation actually refer to the birth of the earth, or rather to that age which was called Zept Tepi in the ranks of the Egyptians? During this, quote, time of the first return, the gods are said to have lived side by side with humans on earth. The divine knowledge then revealed was said to have been collected by mortals in a sacred book, which also recorded the location of the sacred mountains. In addition, many ancient Egyptian temple inscriptions repeatedly refer to a group of seven wise men. These were the only divine creatures who knew how to build temples and holy cities. Thus it was that the seven sages oversaw the construction of these structures from the tops of the sacred mountains. Particularly interesting, the locations of those mountains are equated by some researchers with those of the magnificent pyramids. Thoth, who was the god of the moon in Egyptian mythology, is said to have been involved in the activities of the seven wise men. Together, this alliance pushed forward countless monumental construction projects, including the monumental pyramids. Sensational Finds The problem, apart from the fact that their number was seven, Today, we know nothing more about this mysterious group. In order to draw Link back to the Flood, we should not forget at this point that the catastrophe was by no means the only one documented in the Old Testament. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, and the Greeks, as well as many other peoples, also knew stories about dramatic floods that wiped out large parts of earthly life. Against this background, it seems reasonable to conclude that the deluge described in the Bible actually goes back to other, much older narratives. Let's take a look at the breathtaking discovery that the British archaeologist, Austin Layard, recorded in Assyria in 1849. Together with his team, he recovered around 25,000 cuneiform tablets, which listed, among other things, the kings who ruled the country before and after the Great Flood. However, the archaeological treasure contained another, not entirely insignificant component, the world-famous Gilgamesh epic. The Gilgamesh Flood Interesting to know, this fact only became known more than 20 years after the original discovery. So, in 1872, George Smith decided to decipher more parts of the now outdated collection of plates. Long story short, the story that is so famous today is about the eponymous King Gilgamesh of Uruk, who sets out for the ancestor of the human race in order to seek immortality there. The 11th panel, which bears the title The Flood, is particularly exciting for us today. Asked by Gilgamesh why he is immortal unlike himself, Uta Napisti revealed the ancient secret of a catastrophe long ago. If we look straight into the details of this tradition, it should be immediately clear to everyone why the biblical Noah variant is most likely just a modification of the Gilgamesh tablet. For the sake of completeness, however, it should be noted that the version of the tablet has not been preserved in its entirety, which is why its content was reconstructed from Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian, and some other fragments of tradition. The Ark of Ziusudra The tale says that the god Enki warned a human named Ziusudra of an approaching flood catastrophe that would wipe out all life on earth. To protect oneself from the flood, Enki advised Ziusudra to build a large ship as soon as possible. After he had received the divine warning in a dream, he did not hesitate and immediately tore down his house in order to make the rescue ship out of its fragments. In doing so, he again obeyed the express command of the deity not to warn other people of the approaching danger. After the ship was completed, Zeusudra loaded onto it many animals, his wife, and the rest of his family. Later, as the waters of the flood gradually receded, Zeusudra and his wife were rewarded for saving sentient beings by being deified and invited to the fabled land of the blessed. 
The Search for the Origin At this point, let's look further beyond the biblical box. In addition to the mythologies already mentioned, massive flood disasters were also described in numerous other cultures, including Hinduism, in the ancient Icelandic sagas, in the ranks of the Australian Aborigines, and in China antiquity. In view of this equally lush and diverse source situation, is it really conceivable that all these stories should have a purely metaphorical character? Are we really just dealing with a myth that has been picked up and modified in different parts of the world? It is certain that many severe floods have indeed occurred on Earth over the millennia. In this regard, there is a theory that the sagas really do relate to real events, but dramatize them to the limitless. What we do know is that between the years 13,000 and 9,000 BC, parts of Asia and Europe experienced repeated so-called continental megafloods. Such incidents typically occur when ice reservoirs rupture. Also, volcanic eruptions, sea and earthquakes, and the inrush of water into the Black Sea are repeatedly discussed as causes of the deluge. On the other hand, no less exciting are the approaches that locate the background of the flood not on Earth, but in the proverbial heaven, or precisely, in space. Alien Trigger The corresponding assumptions are based on the consequences of various meteorite and asteroid impacts. Accordingly, some time ago, a projectile from space crashed onto the Earth's surface, where it then set off an immense tidal wave. The approach put forward by the Austrian Otto Heinrich Muck is as adventurous as it is gripping. According to this, the asteroid would not only have triggered a flood catastrophe of biblical proportions, but also destroyed the legendary island kingdom of Atlantis. As part of his work, in which he analyzed numerous legends of the flood of different peoples, Muck came to the conclusion that the catastrophe must have taken place in 8498 BC. Noah's Ark and the Importance of It in Religion Noah's Ark is one of the most widely discussed stories in world history. What makes the Ark particularly interesting is that it has not only been spoken of in the Christian Bible, but also in texts from Judaism and Islam. On top of this, the Sumerians, known as the people of Shinar, spoke of a great flood as well. By all means, this flood does seem to have taken place a few thousand years ago, but scientists and researchers have questioned the validity of these texts until now. Many researchers wondered if a ship of this size and construction would have been able to survive a mass flood. Others also wonder how the ship could have been large enough to fit so many animals. However, experts are now convinced that the story is true after finding what they believe to be the remains of Noah's Ark in a mountain range in Turkey. Noah's Ark in the Mountains of Ararat Sometime around April of 2010, a team of Chinese researchers announced that they had just found the wreckage of Noah's Ark in the Turkish mountains of Ararat, just like the historical texts claimed. This 15-person team of researchers says they are 99.9% .9 certain of their discovery, saying that the only possibility for these remains is that they would have belonged to Noah's Ark. The team researching the finding held a press conference and detailed how they found a scrap of wood and pieces of rope that likely would have been used on the ark. They took extensive photos and videos from the wreckage and shared them with those around the world who tuned in to learn more about this discovery. A team of scientists from a Christian organization known as Noah's Ark Ministries International also claimed to have found a larger structure of the ship at around 4,000 meters above sea level in the mountains of Ararat. To put that into perspective, the mountains are estimated to be about 5,100 meters high. The pieces of wood they found are said to be around 4,800 years old, which would perfectly fit in line with the stories told in the book of Genesis. Considering biblical history dictates the world is only around 6,000 years old. What makes this discovery so incredible is that the researchers found not only fragments of cypress wood, the exact wood that Noah was commanded to use, they also found evidence of the ship being divided off into several smaller segments. These segments closely resemble stables that would have been used to house the animals. According to the team of researchers, these stables would have been sized well enough to fit roughly two of most animals on Earth, including large mammals such as lions, bears, or elephants. 
The exact location of these findings is said to have been kept a secret by the Turkish government until further excavations could be made. However, there's a lot of speculation that these findings may not be genuine. According to several scientists and researchers, a find like this would not be plausible, considering the amount of time that has passed since the Ark would have struck land. Some scientists also reject the idea that Noah's Ark ever existed in the first place. However, this theory seems incredibly unlikely, considering how many eyewitness testimonies have been given over the years, and how many ancient civilizations could have directly descended from Noah's family, and all of them claim that the flood did, in fact, take place. All of this aside, there are a few key pieces of information that could disprove this discovery. According to a few scientists, a Kurdish mountain guide may have been spotted hauling a large amount of wood up to the top of the mountain range. He had supposedly been doing this in an effort to build fragments of a ship at the top of the mountains. He would have also melted snow and let the wood age for a while, giving the illusion that it had been recently uncovered after being trapped under ice for many years. These claims have never been proven, but it is certainly possible that this discovery could have been created by a shrill who is looking to scam people out of money in exchange for guiding them up the mountain. Some researchers who do believe the story of Noah's Ark to be genuine also debate that the Ark would have been found so high on the mountain. According to these scientists, if the story is true, it's almost impossible that the water levels would have risen high enough for the Ark to reach more than 4,000 meters above sea level. According to the researchers, there simply isn't enough water in the world to take a boat so high. And now, we are curious about your opinion. Do you believe that the deluge described in the Bible really happened? As always, let us know your thoughts, suggestions, and feedback on today's video in the comments below. Also, don't forget to leave us a like and a subscription to stay up to date from now on. Finally, please take a look at the other exciting videos of our channel, which we have linked for you here in the credits. And with that, thanks for watching, have a good one, and see you next time.